Hello and welcome to the Crypto Jungle. My name is Baloo the Bear and here on the channel I keep crypto simple. We look at the price in the context of volume using the Wyckoff method. If that is something that interests you, then why don't you hit the subscribe button? I stream every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. So uh, in today's video, Evergrande. You know, the China is very much so in the news. It seems to be the prime focus. There is a lot of fear in the markets. Traditional markets are seeing a little bit of a sell off. That is carrying through into the uh, crypto market as well. There's a lot of comparisons uh, to the financial crisis of 2008 and how many people are saying that Evergrande is at Lehman Brothers 2.0, where we're, we're seeing the first cracks at the dam, where uh, this is going to be a uh, tsunami of fear and uh, collapse of a financial system. Is my sound not on? There should be sound. I believe I have sound. Can I get a sound check? Kahuna's saying no sound. Anyways, uh, so we're gonna take a look at the Evergrande stock. We're gonna take a look at the index. We're gonna take a look at how that is affecting crypto. Um, and without any further ado, let's just uh, get right into it. Okay, so. <clears throat> All right, so. Uh, Ever, China, China's Evergrande's share pummeled on fear of debt defaults. Evergrande scrambles to raise funds to pay off debt regulators and warn of brokers risk to China's financial system. So basically, uh, Evergrande is one of China's largest uh, development companies. They have been uh, in a, they've been around for a very long time and they have contributed to the housing boom, the, the development boom that's been going on in China. Um, for years, uh, China's seen massive, math, massive um, growth rate uh, compared to any other uh, country. And, uh, you know, at the head of that, as far as the development companies, it's been Evergrande. Now, Evergrande has been in hot water for a very long time. This is not new. This is this is a very old story. And I think that, uh, you know, the easiest way that we can take a look at just how long that this has been a problem is we just look at the chart you know the charts don't lie that's that's the biggest thing that i love about um technical analysis is it's just the charts don't lie so here's the peak of evergrande's uh share price in uh october of 2017 so ever since october of 2017 this stock has been in a, in a downtrend it's been making lower lows and lower highs for years. And it's now finally capitulated. Now this is coming on the backs of them, you know, over leveraging themselves with lenders and needing uh, to, being forced to pay back, um, being forced to pay back and honor some of those loans. So what do they have to do? They kind of need to offer discounts on some of the, uh, projects that they're offering, you know, that brings down the, the real estate market and, uh, it's just kind of this trickle down of this uh, this effect that takes place where you know you have a lot of uh, capital that you need to reallocate to pay back the loans. Now, there's a huge fundamental difference between Evergrande and Lehman Brothers, and the biggest difference between those two companies is one is a development company, and the other is a bank. The financial crisis was very interesting in that uh, it was kind of brought on by the banks creating these these mortgage mortgage backed securities and these mortgage backed securities were very very hot. It was very you know profitable to be a bank at that time selling mortgage backed securities to investors. It was uh, it was a way for you to, you know, get in on the action in real estate without actually needing to purchase real estate. So the bubble came from the securities being filled with garbage. They were just useless uh, uh, mortgages that were filled with, you know, uh, borrowers who were not in a position to be able to pay those loans. They weren't in a position to pay those mortgages, especially in the event that a mortgage rate increase occurred. That's a very, very big difference from what we're seeing in Evergrande because Evergrande is simply a developer. So where in 2008, the financial crisis was sparked off by loan defaults, 
this is simply a development company that over leveraged themselves and over um over developed and over bought and uh now the the lenders are, are calling the loan and they need them to pay back so they're gonna have to sell assets they're gonna have to liquidate a lot of their holdings to be able to pay back those loans making the company weaker making this the stock price fall now it's really been in the news a lot because of the plummet so anytime a stock begins to kind of collapse i mean it, it is definitely uh, in a very established downtrend at the tail end of, of what i would call a markdown period um, so of course it's going to make it into the head not headlines now what's going to happen with this development company is really resting on the shoulders of the chinese government so uh, the chinese communist party is going to have to decide whether they're going to allow evergrande to fail or if they're going to step in in the form of some sort of bailout as they are a very important part of the chinese economy in the sense that uh, you know they they are the number one development uh you know they're providing a lot of jobs and uh stimulating the economy in other ways so it's really on the shoulders of the chinese government as to how they want to play this one um they could decide to let it fail and that will have some contagion effects to other markets as we're seeing on the speculative side in traditional finance we're seeing you know uh, a lot of the uh, indexes in all markets uh, decline on this news but me personally, I don't think that this is this is not a, a 2008 financial crisis. This is not uh, an entire debt system built on on false information and nonsense. This is not a bunch of banks loaning and selling useless products. This is this is a developer that got a little over ambitious with the credit card and is now failing as a result of that. So a little bit different, a little bit different. <laughs> Yeah, RSI looks very oversold, might buy the dip. Eh, if you can get Chinese stocks, go for it. Um, you know, it does, these are kind of the typical characteristics of what we would see. So like, you know, we follow the Wyckoff method, accumulation, markup, distribution, markdown. Those are kind of the, the uh, it's the, the, the order of operations for a price cycle. We had an accumulation, we got our sign of strength, we broke out of the trading range, and we marked up and then it's been marking down ever since uh, i don't really trust how uh, competent this company is um, and they will require a bailout to at least be given a second chance so if you wanted to take a very high risk play then yeah go ahead and and buy it because uh you know if they are the recipient of a bailout or some positive news or some sort of subsidy from the government then yeah they'll probably you know take their slap on the wrist and uh and move forwards with maybe better intentions and uh, more responsible lending practice, uh, more responsible borrowing practices. We got to remember this isn't a bank. This is a this is a company. Okay. Interesting timing considering the current state of uh, geo slash political. Yeah, you know uh, the cracks are beginning to show in a lot of other places as well. Um, but stimulus is also a really, really big part of what's going on right now. I don't know if the rich are really ready yet. I don't know if they're ready for, you know, any sort of collapse or reshuffling or reorganization or, you know, the reset, the great reset. I don't know if they're, they could be ready. Um, now we're getting very kind of conspiratorial and, and, and speculative. But, um, you know, I feel like... I feel like people aren't really ready, so they're going to keep the party going. We have the uh, Fed talking about uh, the debt ceiling on Wednesday. Typically with the debt ceiling, it's kind of just a, a an arbitrary meeting because you already have an agreed upon budget. And the only thing that's standing in the way upon the voted and agreed upon budget is the debt ceiling. So it's like, OK, well, we agree with spending over here. We got to do this, that and the other. Oh, but for us to do that, we have to raise the debt ceiling. Okay, well, let's have a meeting so that we can raise the debt ceiling. It's just, it's pointless. And uh, I anticipate that the debt ceiling will be raised as they always raise it. So, you know, I think it's kind of a, a short term thing that we're looking at here. I think that this is kind of just, you know, companies are beginning to fail. 
and it's an early warning sign for sure. I think that it's something that needs to be considered, but there are a lot of comparisons that people are making calling this uh, a Lehman Brothers or calling it a, uh, uh, you know, the, the beginning of a financial crisis. And I think that that's a little overdramatic personally. Um, especially considering when you look at how Lehman Brothers fell, like this has been in a downtrend for a very long time. Anybody who knows technical analysis, this is on the monthly chart, the, no, the weekly chart, anybody who knows technical analysis would have gotten out of this uh, stock a long time ago because you could see that their performance was, was not yielding very good gains. And then you look at uh, Lehman Brothers. Lehman Brothers was, was pretty flat. And then they had kind of a sell-off event that broke structure. They got a, uh, a higher low, and then they collapsed very, very quickly. It was not, uh, you know, it was very, very sudden. This last bar here to the bottom was a 98.94. It traded to zero, you know. Um, but yeah, very different case from what we're seeing with Evergrande. Uh, but yeah, like I said, it is affecting the markets. This is the Hang Seng Index, which is a, a the Hong Kong uh, equivalent of the S&P 500 basket of strong uh, Chinese-based indexes. Seeing a little bit of a distributional top here um, up against an area of resistance that we just haven't been able to break through. So who knows, maybe we have a little bit of a retracement, uh, but maybe we take another run at it. As a result, maybe we bounce off of this line right here bounce off that general area and give another shot and you know everybody's back making funny money again so who knows it's it's really uh it's an interesting time we're living in and it's very hard to be level-headed in these markets when they're very emotionally charged and there's a lot of retail in the space and there's a lot of news stories and geopolitical turmoil and a lot of reasons to be bearish fundamentally uh but the funny money keeps flowing the money printer keeps going burr so I don't know. It's we have to let the charts tell us what's going on. In the case of Evergrande, yeah, not looking great. You can see the chart. You can see the important part. I keep my face out of it. Which graph are we talking about? Oh, the Lehman Brothers. Yeah, it's there's nothing to it, really. Like, that's it. Lehman Brothers. It was just flat, broke structure, high or low, or sorry, low or high, and then just a collapse. Thoughts on the bailout of Grande? Uh, it, I have no idea. You know, I'm very much so disconnected from the news reel of China. I think most people would probably feel like they fall under that category as well. Uh, if there's anybody watching who is from China and maybe has a little bit of a better gauge on what they think the, the Chinese Communist Party is going to be doing in terms of uh, a bailout or what they're leaning towards, um, let us know in the comments below. But uh, yeah, I don't, I don't have a thought on that at all, um, other than I think it's in the best interest. You know, we're playing in a world of funny money. It's it's kind of the last time the governments decided to let a bank fail was the, the financial crisis. Uh, oh, wait, again, this isn't a bank, but, you know, letting these companies fail do have ripple effects. I don't think it's going to make it to the banking sector, but only time will tell. Cashed out of your bear signal. What's your strategy for re-entry? I did not cash out. I'm uh, ignoring that signal for now. I want to give it a few days. I've not cashed out. So how do you prepare for this scenario? Well, typically speaking, um, you know, anytime there's a financial collapse, um, there's it comes in the context of a lower high. So, you know, in the, in the context of what we're seeing here on Evergrande, it... <laughs> There's no action that can be taken if you're a shareholder. Uh, basically, we're at a bottom and you need to pay attention to what uh, what news comes out of China as a result of how they want to handle this because there will be ripple effects. Uh, if you can't handle the volatility, you can always hedge. You can, you know, 
if you're wherever your exposure is, you can usually find a tool to counteract that exposure, or you can sit in cash, or you can just uh, think like I, I'm thinking and think it's short term and kind of hold your long investments as people kind of get shaken out of positions. Uh, none of us are wrong until one of us is right. So, you know, we can't really predict. We can only see what's happening in real time. These candles are printed, you know, every minute, at, every day we get a new candle and that's the most up-to-date information you have. You can't interpret the future. You can only interpret what you have in front of you. So um, as far as what I'm doing, I'm waiting to see more conviction one way or the other. I think it's just a little bit of FUD in the markets. Uh, we'll have to see what the US does with their debt ceiling. If they raise the debt ceiling, hey, we're going to print more money and hey, it's going to go into the equities market. So that's going to prop us up a little bit further, uh, further inflating a bubble. I'm, I'm not denying that there's a fundamental problem here. I just you know, the trend is your friend until it ends. And we've been in a very, very, very strong uptrend for the most part. S&P did break structure. So typically when the S&P breaks structure, that's the first little signal. It's on the uh, small, on the uh, weekly here. We broke below this low and it looks like, uh, well, we'll see how this candle closes. If we go to the daily chart, we can get a better handle on things. But yeah, we did break structure on the S&P. So that will probably, there's a, a probability that that results in some sort of a sell-off. That sell-off will rally and that rally will need to decide. We'll see what happens as a result of that rally. Cause you can see it does it all the time. It sells off, rallies to a new high, sells off, rallies to a new high, sells off, rallies to a new high, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That's just how the S&P operate sometimes the sell-offs are are brutal and this one was a hell of a fake out because it rallied to a higher a lower high but then it collapsed down or it retraced back to a higher low so it can be tricky um but yeah we'd be waiting for some similar structure to what we see, saw back here but this is just proving how much the government is really stepping in in my opinion because when you have a structure like this that has a high a low a lower high um and then it, it, you know, typically that's where you get a meltdown. Um, but it just doesn't happen. This is such a weird chart. Like, look at this chart. This is not a, a normal chart, guys. This is weird. Show me a chart that looks like this. We go up, we get scared, we fall. We go up, we get scared, we fall. It's just such a strange and bizarre chart. And the only thing that I can think of is that it's just having fake money injected into it consistently so the markets are famous for having these kind of uh sell-off events where everybody gets scared and it's the end of the world because nobody has faith in the in the ability for this to continue so it's kind of interesting yeah let's take a look at what's going on with bitcoin got quite a bearish cross we keep uh falling back down into the channel things are looking really ugly uh as far as the price action of the last two days. However, um, this is not uncharacteristic of a typical test. There's a lot of fear in the markets here, but you know, we had our high, we had our low, we broke out of our accumulation, and now we're trying to test that area. We closed above the consolidation, and we're now testing the liquidity back inside of the channel. If we get bought back in and start closing candle bodies above 42.4, then, um, I think that that's relatively healthy. I do like the volume that came in here. It's showing a lot of interest to protect this level. We are currently breaking below the 40, which is the bullish control zone on the daily chart. Um, it's it's tricky. It's tricky to be a short term trader in these environments. Um, you could probably get a short in, but it's it's risky. Um, yeah. Bitcoin dominance probably still trading sideways. Interesting. So Bitcoin's moving down, but I guess the alts are moving down more. Uh, that's why it's just trading sideways. I, I want to see it kind of break below for an altcoin season, but it's very hard for us to be talking in terms of an altcoin season right now when Bitcoin's just simply not behaving. Uh, this is the area of the backup, though. This is the area of the test where you want to pay attention. Uh, if we can be, if we can defend this level, which, you know, we just opened our new daily candle, we have 24 hours to defend this level. If we can defend this level, that would be positive. 
but if we can't and fall back inside the channel honestly i'm going to be seriously considering the probability that we're not going to have structure like we've had in previous cycles and i'm going to take a much more conservative approach and uh sit a lot of stuff out and wait and see because uh the price action is just not behaving uh in a typical fashion from what we've seen in previous cycles it's very unpredictable right now it's it's at a teetering point and why we're at a teetering point has to do with the fact that on the macro this could be a lower high exactly like we talked about on the uh, indexes you know when you have an all-time high and then we have a low and then we have a lower high if this confirms as a lower high which by the way it doesn't confirm until it breaks below the low this is macro moves we're talking about here so not something that you want to stick around for and, and be exposed to um, but if we do that it's bear market if we break below 20 28 8 it's a bear market and uh, we need to pack it up and it's very disappointing because uh, a lot of the trades i mean i have my long-term trades i bought bitcoin at nine nine grand ten grand and eleven grand so i've got profitable trades but uh for the most part the alts coin the altcoins just kind of diluted my portfolio for this run which is kind of unfortunate not exactly what i was planning for um but you know markets are going to do what they're going to do they're completely irrational and uh if you think you can predict the future uh, here is a reminder as to why you cannot because at the end of the day all these candles represent are monkeys buying and selling bananas that's it you think btc will trade for a while between 30 and 50 it's possible uh if we start getting down to 30 i'm sitting it out I'm gonna wait for a big, um, big conviction to the upside. You know, I'd, I'd be buying at much higher levels, honestly. If we started trading sideways, I'm gonna wait for a bigger con confirmation. Uh, so, you know, if we're range bound and you wanna play that range, go for it. But, uh, you know, it's pretty hard to play the ranges. I like to buy breakouts. Still waiting on the V-shaped recovery from Lehman. Oh, it's coming. <laughs> it's coming. Uh, might form a bull flag on the weekly and break out for the next bull run. Uh, bull flag. I don't know. I guess you could call it a bull flag. Sure. Yeah. I mean, you just need to, we just need to start ticking to the upside. If you can get a close above 60 on the weekly, that'll be a breakout. That'll be something that I'm interested in. Typically, bull flags are coming after a big move i guess on the weekly you could make that argument bitcoin shaking leverage longs out right now it's going it's going hard <laughs> about to break 40. yeah Let's see what we got here so other than cash out would you cash out of the s p 500 and wait for re-entry or perhaps hedge with options so that you can benefit from a collapse um you know cashing out on cashing out on bearish news is not usually a strategy that i like to follow um i typically look at the structure so you know i wasn't paying attention to evergrande i never fucking heard of evergrande before it was all over the news and everything that anybody was talking about uh with the s p we did break structure it's up to you now typically when you break structure you're going to get some sort of bearish test and that's really what you want to pay attention to so let's say we break structure here we we you know melt down a little bit there will be some sort of recovery because we need to prove to the traders and the market that we can't overtake the level that we broke so at the point we you know retrace more and and go in for a bearish test um, if it can't make it above, then it's time to call it. And, uh, you know, with the intent to buy back lower is kind of an interesting... I never sell with that intent. Uh, not with, like, a short-term target in mind. When the market is bearish, I'm out. And I'm out until it's bullish again. 
it's not like hey i'm gonna get down to like a fib retracement or i'm gonna get down to this support level and then i'm gonna buy and be a buyer again it doesn't i don't trade that way um if i decide to cut an investment if i decide to exit it's simply to exit and wait and observe and then when i see a retracement or i see a reason to get back in i'll re-enter um but uh you know it's it typically takes a lot longer for those types of things to play out than most people are waiting for they just see a big dump and they're like oh yeah this is it or that you know youtube starts saying yeah this is it we're we're done um but yeah it's uh you know if you're gonna make those types of harsh decisions depending on the style of trader that you are i i trade the macro swings i trade the big moves um and those take time to play out. So I'm in no rush to panic at this point. I'm in no rush to make any rash decisions. I'm going to make adjustments to my portfolio after we have more data. Um, if you're a higher frequency trader, then yeah, you should have already been out, honestly. Um, if you're trading the weeks or you're trading the days, then you should have already been out, but your stop would have taken you out. The dollar goes down, then the S&P goes up in dollars. The dollar goes down, every asset uh, goes up in dollars. Because that's the correlation between the two. If, if, unless, it, unless they're both falling, but there's a correlation there, right? Because it's denominated in the dollar. So if the value of that is falling, if the value of the dollar is falling, then the price of a Big Mac goes up. Dipping again, only Saitama is holding. Saitama. Usually when things are holding in dumps, it means it's a liquid. But let's take a look. What is Saitama? Saitama Inu. Oh, for fuck's sakes. Yeah, nobody's buying it. That's why. It's holding. Holding steady. That is some illiquid bullshit, my friend. Saitama. Gross. Best of luck. Best of luck. Uh, do you have a day job or manage your portfolio? I have a few revenue streams. I manage my portfolio. That's kind of the macro, big payday, big kind of, you know, the big check stuff that I take out when I have a big win, which is not a consistent schedule. I have a trading group. So if you are interested in joining the trading group, there are links below for you to join the community and learn everything crypto, whether it's trading, whether it's DeFi, whether it's anything you want to learn in regards to interacting with cryptocurrency and uh, trading it, then uh, you know, follow the links below. 50% off your first month with the coupon code WELCOME. And then I also uh, am a manager in the Axie Infinity ecosystem. So I've got a few pots that I'm playing with, a few little revenue streams. <laughs> Stay poor. Dude, this is illiquid. I would never buy this calling me a moron you're buying some illiquid shitcoin you know it's just <sighs> whatever man saitama saitama you know meme coins are dead right you don't even have a market cap there's 16 million dollars worth of trading volume i don't know man i really don't know Or I do know, and I'm just trying to be polite. <laughs> uh, what about Axie? Came back after one and a half months. Seems Axie prices are going down as well. Yeah, so Axie is in a very well-established downtrend. It's, it's an ugly chart. You know, SLP is just shit in the bed. There's no, there's no uh, getting around that at all. 
And the thing about downtrend is uh, it will continue to go down. You know, the trend is your friend until it ends. So until Axie can at least trade sideways, the assumption is lower and lower prices. This will just keep going lower and lower. So, you know, you can't really, you have to submit to that. So, you know, I, I'm earning SLP with the Axie Infinity ecosystem and my dollar value is going down. It's going down and down and down. And that's the trend. So until we can break this downtrend and start trading sideways, there's really no, you know, there's nothing we can do. I, it, I kind of look at this one a little bit different though, because it's not like I'm investing in it. It's not like I'm purchase, going out and purchasing SLP to speculate on the price going up. Uh, my scholars and I are earning the SLP. So it is a little bit different. I have more of a tolerance to just accumulate in, the, in that kind of condition because I do have a lot of faith that the team at Axie Infinity will at least drive interest back into the ecosystem and get the marketplace a little more liquid than it has been in the, uh, recently. But yeah, you know, it's a, it's a very significant downtrend and it's because we're minting more SLP than we're burning. Uh, the scholars and the players mint SLP and the breeders burn SLP when they breed. Nobody's breeding. That's the problem. So we're minting and minting and minting and there's no burning going on. And there's no there's no end in that for a while until we get attention back here. I think the price of AXS has to fall. I think we need to get AXS to a cheaper level because it costs AXS. I think the breeding fee for AXS should also drop. We need to re-incentivize the breeding for you know anything to change here. So because none of that is happening and because none of that is changing, this trend will slowly tick to the downside consistently. It's not gonna stop until something changes. So that's what we're all waiting for. There is a DEX in the works, but uh, yeah. I have heard of Avagachi. Uh, Valorant is saying uh, it's really cool you have are involved in Axie, have you heard of Avagachi? It's another play to earn project. I haven't gotten hands on with uh, Avagachi, so I, I can't really say much. Um, but the thing, there's a, there's a few ingredients in play to earn that I find really, really valuable. And the first number one ingredient that I think is really, really important is your ability as a purchaser of the NFT I can go and buy axes, right? And I can put them in my wallet and I can keep them safe in my wallet. And then I can give those axes to another player to play. Most games don't do that. And honestly, that is from a business standpoint, that model, I, I don't care. You know, I'm not a gamer. I can just, I can look at a, a marketplace and I can get excited with what I'm seeing with the adoption and the user base and the scalability. Play to earn games where you're the only one playing the game and you can't, you know, scale through building a network of players underneath you uh, is limiting. You can only earn so much money. So, yeah, you might be able to earn some money playing Avagachi, but unless you can take Avagachis and give them to other people and have hundreds and hundreds of Avagachis that people are playing, there's no scalability to that business model. And that's that's the biggest thing I'm looking for. Another thing that I'm looking for is a... Uh, a multiple currency model. So I don't know what Avagachi pays. Um, like I said, I haven't looked into it, but SLP is issued, AXS is required and used for governance. So there's a speculative token and then there's a utility token. Um, and then wrapped Ethereum is the marketplace. So I don't know, it's, uh, it's interesting to see all of these other play to earn games who are claiming to be the next big thing, but they're missing a lot of the ingredients that drew me and a lot of people who aren't gamers who are just looking for good business opportunity and investment. Uh, you're not gonna draw those people in, you know, you're only gonna draw in gamers. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that. You know, a gamer can make money, but um, if, if you want investment and you want businesses, that's where a ton of demand comes in because it's not, it's not just, hey, I need three axes to play. It's like, no, I wanna scale a business where I own 300 axes. So there's an incredible amount more of demand with those types of models, which is why I think Axie has been so successful. Do I think it's a good time to breed now? Um, I think if you're breeding 
playable axes, it's a good time because those the marketplace is still rather liquid for that. The prices of axes are continuing to fall. So you would need to crunch the numbers and see um, how profitable it is because I think the margins are really, really tight. Uh, but it depends on what you're breeding for. So if you're breeding to provide for scholars, uh, weigh it out price wise and see if it's cheaper for you to just buy, um, you know, an axie that's been bred like six times versus buying a bunch of virgin axes and uh, and breeding those where you might get if you breed four you might get one or two are actually what you want. Um, so, you know, the card sets are really important right now. It's less about purity. Cardano says, uh, do you think this will it'll be possible that Cardano will be the only cryptocurrency that survives this dip? Well, what Cardano has in its favor during these types of moments is the fact that everybody stakes it. So because everybody is kind of a staker, um, there, the downside potential is less. That being said, I do think that it's currently overvalued and it needs a little bit of a market correction because of the fact that, you know, they have smart contracts now, but nothing's really developed. So they do need time to create their offerings, create their marketplaces, create their dApps um, so that we can reassess the value. And everything's in a downtrend right now. So I, I think it's highly plausible that you could expect it to hold support in this general range you know, back at the area of the previous trading range. Uh, so you could expect support at $1.80. Uh, um, if that fails to hold, $1 is incredibly strong support. We've seen this in Cardano. Uh, $1 is very, very powerful support. If it fails to hold a dollar though, then Cardano is really in serious trouble. Now this would be in the context of a bear market, which we're still trying to decide if uh, Bitcoin is in a bear market or not. If Bitcoin's in a bear market, I would expect Cardano to break through a dollar and probably retrace back down to levels of 40 cents, something like that, uh, and trade sideways for a few years. Now, I'm talking very bearish. I don't know. This is the only thing to pay attention to right now is this support level right here. So lots of things retracing, uh, but you know, it looks like we're getting bought back in. This is exactly what I was talking about earlier in the stream, breaking back into the channel. We need to defend this level. So as long as we can hold above 42.4, 42, yeah, 42.4, 42.5, then we're looking relatively healthy as this is exactly what's expected as far as a test. You know, we had our sign of strength breaking out. Oops, where's my pen? Give me my pen. We have a sign of strength breaking out of the channel and then coming down to test that channel. Oh, wow, that's very clear. But, uh, you know, we're trying to test the channel here. The top of the channel is the test range right here. So as long as we don't fail below this, uh, if we fail to hold this level, honestly, we're going back probably to the bottom of the channel. That's going to be very, very unhealthy from a structural point of view, and it's going to threaten a new lower low. If we get a new lower low, I'm out. Avogachi is bringing lending slash renting Avogachi. So uh, Rev does that and it's very unprofitable. Uh, you make basically no money with, you know, lending out your Avogachis for other players to play. Um, it's just peanuts. So if you have enough of them, sure. But I think the Avogachis are, are kind of overpriced currently. So it's hard to get it to scale where it actually becomes something worth it. And it, effectively it's staking, you know, staking rewards are minimal. They're not usually worth it uh, in most circumstances. So, uh, you know, staking your Avogachis, you know, you don't really get a lot. It wasn't hatched in the NFT mania either. Nope, that's correct. It was, uh, yeah, it's been around for a while. Show the main supports of BTC. So the main supports of BTC are currently where we are right now. 
and then honestly we're at the bottom you know there's a there's an intermediary intermediary one right down here at the middle of the channel and then there's one at the bottom if we get to the bottom well first of all i will already be out i don't like that kind of structure and if we break below that we're in a bear market we're in a bear market it's not uh in my opinion it's not up for negotiation anymore so again i'm talking about the bearishness when we're still working on the current support if we can hold here we're good if we can hold here we're good and it's a successful test and it's exactly what i'm looking for for a successful test and it gives us the ability to turn around and uh, break out of our backup phase on this Wyckoff accumulation and head to the upside, uh, begin to threaten the uh, the all-time high. So, you know, don't let my downside targets be construed as bearishness. I'm just saying if we get to those levels, we got to flip the way we're thinking. Right now, I'm thinking we're on a test and the test is fine. The test, if successful, is actually bullish. So. I'm not necessarily worried currently. Uh, sold my AXS when I came back into profit. Get out of it. Yeah. SLP is down very much so. Am I scaling down? No. Uh, I spent all my AXS on breeding. I'm earning SLP, so I'm not investing in it uh, other than my previous investments into Axie and creating scholarships. Um, so I'm not scaling down. You know, I have scholars playing the game. They're going to continue to play the game. They're, they're earning uh, a living off of that. So I'm not going to, you know, take Axies away from them. And I'm certainly not going to sell into the marketplace that's weak right now. I, I had the intent to hold those NFTs long term. I do see a long-term vision for Axies, so I don't think that those NFTs are uh, are going to be useless. I think that they will have a use case moving forwards, but yeah. Yeah, BT yeah, let's do some on-chain stuff. Thank you, uh, Greg Usler. Let's do, let's do a little on-chain stuff because you know, this this stream is turning quite bearish and I and I think there's some fundamentals here. Uh, with the on-chain that can show you that it's not all doom and gloom because we have people investing and accumulating. We are in an accumulation of Bitcoin ever since the bottom of the shakeout. Investors have been accumulating. So this is balances of over 0.1, so it's still retail. This is balances of one sharp increase of uh, Bitcoin balances holding over one Bitcoin. We're seeing a lot of wallets, so there's a lot of accumulation in that general area. And then 10, you know, this is going to take longer to recover. The big whales typically sell six months out from the top anyways, so this is not uncharacteristic of what we've seen in previous cycles. Um, and same can be said with Bitcoin addresses holding over 100 as people take profits near the all-time high and just say, hey, I made enough money, we're good. Um, but yeah, we still see very strong accumulation. People aren't dumping out of this. Nothing has changed. This is a very strong upward trajectory of accumulation with addresses holding over one Bitcoin, which is good. The network usage is increasing as well. There's a lot of transactions. The transaction... Um, volume is increasing that's how we measure the value of a cryptocurrency is based on how much network usage it is getting so it is increasing i think it's fine <laughs> um, from a fundamental standpoint but the problem is publicly traded markets and markets as liquid as cryptocurrency will you know they're easier than other markets to manipulate so there's a lot of leverage carried in this ecosystem. And sometimes the exchanges aren't interested in honoring some of those contracts and they would rather liquidate and then carry forward so that they don't have to honor the over leveraged traders who are playing with money that they shouldn't be playing with um, and letting them squeak through and, and get uh, a move up. So the majority of them do get open interest is really, really low. This is not indicative of a large move so i think a lot of the leverage has already been flushed out and i think this is kind of just the last little move of that as people bailed on their positions funding rate is still positive or relatively neutral um yeah 
things are looking good and healthy for continuation. Exchange flows continue to fall, which is showing a supply shock. This is also characteristic of uh, continuation. When you look at uh, previous market, market cycle tops, you have huge, huge inflows, right? Like look at the trajectory, look at the uh, angle of supply flushing back into the system, going back into the exchanges so that they can be sold. Um, that's what you have on the final run up. Here, you know, you have a, a blip in the road here with a supply crunch that led into the supply re entering the exchanges. We are still in a supply crunch. Honestly, from the on chain stuff, I, I really try to stay neutral. I really try to stay neutral. But what, from what I'm seeing on the on chain, is there's just no fucking Bitcoin. There's no Bitcoin on the exchange. If demand kicks in, really strong demand for whatever reason, whatever narrative, whatever the case may be. If if demand steps in, we've got incredibly low supplies available on the exchanges. And uh, that's going to be where you see Bitcoin at prices that, you know, would be very ridiculed in the YouTube and Twitter world for any, you know, influencer or creator even saying these numbers. They'd be if, if these numbers were said, people would be like, you are a moron. You have no idea what you're talking about, um, you know, delete or whatever. Uh, so I'm not going to say it, but I I can say that crypto is a very surprising asset. Specifically, Bitcoin can surprise most people. Um, so, yeah, um, this is not a characteristic of a blow off top. This is not a characteristic of a conclusion of the bull market. Uh, but that's the on-chain stuff. So, you know, this always gets in the way of the on-chain is the technicals and the speculation and the public markets and the manipulation and all of that will get in the way of the fundamentals. I don't think you heard that right, Cardano. So you'd suggest continue holding unless a drop below 36K. Uh, that's currently where I'm at. I'm going to, again, watch watch the price action, watch the markets, watch the FUD. Um, the structure of this la last rally is identical to the first rally to 65K. I don't really trade fractals. Wobi is notorious for doing that. Okay. Good morning, Odette. No, I'm not currently worried, but you know, I have uh, the advantage of being a buyer of Bitcoin during the bear market. The China FUD is what's scary. Yep. Be easy with a truly free market. Yeah, free markets are easy to manipulate. Thoughts on Atom, Cosmos. Let's see, how much time do we have? I do have to run. I gotta get into the virtual classroom. If you guys are interested in the virtual classroom where we talk about your strategy, your plans, your portfolio, and any questions you have in regards to uh, cryptocurrency, we do hold virtual classrooms three days a week uh, in the VIP group. If you don't have an FTX account and you don't have a Bybit account, you can actually get your first month for free. Just go to the cryptojungle.com and uh, sign up for those under our affiliate links with those exchanges and we will honor uh, a free month and that will give you 12 virtual classroom sessions. There's a ton of value in that group. Uh, a lot of very experienced traders who are all watching out this market, you know, calling the moves as they appear, calling the breakouts once they present themselves and uh, you know, a pulse on the market for 24 hours. You know, I'm only here three hours a week. I'm here Monday, Wednesday, and Friday for an hour. So if you want 24 hour clarity, you need to be somewhere where they offer that. So if you are interested, links below, 50% uh, off with the coupon code welcome. Or if you don't have an FTX account, just sign up for one and we give you a free month. Futures market is green, maybe a good sign. Yeah, let's take a look at, uh, uh, I don't know if I have time to look at Adam, but yeah, futures market screen for a recovery. 
Uh, when will you be out? And when you say out, you mean 100% of all your Bitcoin or like 50% out? 100% uh, of all trading accounts will be in cash. I do have a huddle position that just doesn't get touched. That's part of the strategy. Even at the all time high, when I'm like, yeah, we're done, I still don't touch it. That's just part of my strategy, my investment plan. It's a, it's a no touch stack. It is what it is. A lot of people don't understand that, but it is what it is. Uh, do you stay in alts or take loss to get out if the bear market? Oh yeah, if we're in a bear market, it's cash, man. Cash and shorts. That's it. There's no altcoin that I will be holding. Even my favorite altcoins I will not be holding through a bear market. There's no way. Just became a whole co coin coiner myself, so I'll be on that plus one chart. Well done. Congratulations. So long-term S&P 500 or Bitcoin alts and what percentage of your portfolio, let's say five years if you don't wish to trade and just hold, or would your stance be to always trade? I think at this point in the market cycle, it's tricky. Um, I would, you know, what I want to say is have a bit of a take profit strategy because we're at the point in the market cycle where all of your entries are going to retrace they're going to retrace below so you'll make a bunch of money you'll get all excited and then you'll watch all that money disappear and you'll get frustrated and then you'll watch it go below and you'll be kicking yourself we're in the later stages of a bull market so it's very tricky to just become a hodler now um it's very tricky to be a trader as well so you know Make decisions on how, how much you want to hold, which assets you want to hold. I would typically say that, you know, I don't want to hodl altcoins unless I bought those altcoins during a bear market. People make money in bull markets. They get rich in bear markets. You have to buy these assets. You become a hodler. You can become a liquidity provider. You can become a staker. You can fucking get into mining. You can take positions and create your own portfolio in the bear market. It'll come. It will come. There will be another bear market. Mark my words. And it'll feel like the dumbest thing that you're doing, that you're investing at those times. But that is just human psychology. And that's how these markets work. Um, so right now you're in markup or you're at the top. <laughs> so becoming a hodler is kind of hard for me to make that recommendation currently. All right. When you say cash out, is it USDT or 69? I'm not your group. <laughs> I'll just tell you that right now. You can, you know, yeah, I'm not your group. Sorry. All right. So that is, uh, that is all the time I have for today. If you guys enjoyed this content, please give it a like. Don't forget to subscribe. And if there are any projects that you would like me to take a look at, leave them in the comment section down below. And until next time, please trade safe. It is a jungle out there. Peace.